Yeah, can you hear me? Very good. I fast, uh, let me remove my mask first. <laughs> I fast the AV to help me to do the cordless. Uh, we have been experimenting with various things and thank you for your patience. Um, to make sure that our worship online experience is actually more fruitful and more engaging. And one of which is to have um, cordless mics and different camera rolls and things like that for the recording itself. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, my very long time friend. I've known Ben and Grace for almost 30 years. No, close to that. <laughs> uh, so we started working, uh, I started working my very first job, I, I met Ben and uh, we were colleagues uh, for a few years and today they are here with us with uh, their children uh, Deborah and also Daniel and we are very happy please warmly welcome them um, and af after the service do uh, say hello to them as well all right um, we have a lot of things to pray for before I begin uh, we do know that Richard is now uh, out of the ICU, uh, he's in ICA ward right now after his valve replacement. Thank you for praying. Uh, Alice just texted me that his fever is down, his blood pressure seems to be stabilizing, but we still want to pray for, for him and for those of us who are sick amongst us. Shall we all bow our heads in prayer? Our gracious Father in heaven, thank you again for your mercy. They are indeed new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. And we ask, Father God, that you will continue to help us to be grateful for all that you have given to us. Thank you, Lord, that indeed we are people with hope in a world that is filled with hopelessness. And we are people of shalom, of peace, when the world knows no peace. And as we come before you today, we want to remember especially Richard and thank you, Father God, for protecting him for allowing him to go through the very difficult surgery, but nevertheless, he's now recovering. And we entrust his life, his health, his healing into your hands. And may you also give him that shalom, that peace that surpasses all understanding. We also pray for Alice as well. You, you sustain her and give her strength as she cares not only just for Richard, but also for her family. Thank you, Father God, for the privilege of praying for one another. And we want to remember even those of us amongst us who are sick, our members and regular visitors, may your comfort, may your peace be with them as well. And Father God, now as we are about to open up your word, may you speak to us, may your favour be shown to all of us. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Looks like it doesn't work. Is it working? Still working? Okay, good. Test. My test. It's okay. <laughs> Technology and I don't seem to uh, get together. I don't have favor for technology. When things go wrong, it, and it often does, uh, it always happens to me. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor Wen Ping was preaching and this was fine. So each week, we have our different challenges. And indeed, we need favor, don't we? And favor in the... Uh, and this is not set up, by the way. <laughs> favor uh, in, in Oxford Dictionary says that it's approval or support or liking for someone or something. And uh, another translation or another interpretation of that word itself is an act of kindness that is beyond what is due or usual. And finally, of course, if you think about party favor, it's like a small, inexpensive gift given to guests during a party or during an event. Now, we all need favors, especially God's favor. And today, we want to talk about God's favor, how God shows His favor to His people his chosen people. And favor in the Bible is equated to blessings and God's provision. God's favor, as we go through this series in the book of Ruth or the scroll of Ruth, is shown. But 
not the way we thought it should be shown. God's favour is shown in His hiddenness. He's behind the scenes. He's the one who's orchestrating everything. And yet, the people in this scroll, in this book, does not know that God is indeed sovereign. He's indeed showing those favour. And as we continue on in this series, um, I know that uh, I've entitled it uh, Roof, the best is yet to be. We've started this series last week with Pastor Wimping, and today I'm continuing on in Roof chapter 2. But um, I just realized that uh, when I named it The Best is Yet to Be, uh, some of you asked me, Am I from ACS, Anglo Chinese School? I, I said, No, I'm not from ACS. In fact, I'm a neighborhood kid, you know, neighborhood school. And uh, uh, no offense to those of us who are from ACS, right? Maybe amongst us, there are some of us who are from ACS. However, it encapsulates that hiddenness of God, that sovereignty of God that sometimes is not revealed to us. And that is why I say the best is yet to be because we do not see the full plan, the whole picture of what God is doing to His people and to His creation. And because of that, we need to be patient. We don't understand nor know what God is doing behind the scenes. And like the story of Ruth, like the story of Ruth, the best is yet coming. It's still coming. And there are precious lessons that you and I need to learn from trusting God, from knowing that He is there in our times of need. And so the question I ask ourselves today is this, how does God provide for us in our times of need? How do we see and understand and know that He is there for us? Especially when we go through hard times, when things do not go our way, when things seem to be like we're swimming against the current of life. And this is where we need to understand this idea of God's provision, His favour upon us, because our God is our Jehovah Jireh, Yireh. God provides. But how? How does He provide for us, especially when we fall on hard times, especially when things do not go our way? And this is where we turn our attention to Ruth. Ruth chapter 2. But before we, we do that, let us remember what was preached last week. If you remember, life fell hard on Naomi and, of course, her family. A famine hit Judah and, of course, they left their own place, their own uh, city. I may call it a little village, but it's a city at that time of Bethlehem and went to the land of Moab. And there... Her two sons married the Moabites, the Moabite woman, but her husband, Elimelech, died, and so did her two sons. And so, one blow after another blow after another blow caused Naomi to say in Ruth chapter 1, verse 13, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And dropping down a few verses in verse 20, he says that the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Which is why when, her, when she returned back to Bethlehem, she told her people, don't call me Naomi sweet. Don't call me sweet. Call me bitter, Mara, because the Lord has dealt heavily on me. And Pastor Wombing reminded us that life is suffering and that we are to, to live is to suffer. And Suffering sometimes can be very ambiguous. We don't know why we suffer. Just like Job didn't know why he suffered, because of the hiddenness of God. Not understanding that God allows us to go through those kind of testing to prove and strengthen our faith. And so, there is always a surprise last week we said, Pastor Wumbi said, there's always a surprise at the end. The best is yet to be. And so, at the end of the suffering, there's always a rainbow waiting for us. At the end of a storm, 
There's always a rainbow behind that. And today, as we turn to chapter 2, we want to discover for ourselves how God provides. How does God show His favour to us? And in order for us to understand that and persevere in the midst of a storm, in order for us to walk the journey of faith with God, we need to understand three aspects of God's provision. I have said that there are three things about the hiddenness of God that we need to understand and His provision that we need to understand. The first is the mystery of God's provision. The second is the means of the modality, the method that he provides, if I may. And finally, of course, is the messiness of God's provision. The messiness of God's provision. And so we come to today's passage, and that is to embrace that mystery of God's provision. And we turn our attention to verses 1 to 7. I won't read that to you. But I want you to know that the situation now seems to be quite desperate. As we read in verse 1, we realize that, uh, verse 1 and 2, that Naomi and Ruth probably are very hungry at this point of time. They are wondering who is going to provide us for our meals. How is God going to show favor to them? And where can they find favor? In fact, the word favor is repeated three times in today's passage in chapter 2. Are you aware of that? Let me point to you in verse 3, verse 10, and verse 13. Verse 3, 10, and 13. Three times it's repeated about favor. Where, and, and, and in fact, those words came up from uh, Ruth herself, saying, how can we find favor? Why is it that I have favor with you? And of course, the story goes, Ruth, being a good daughter-in-law, volunteered to glean from the field in verse 2. And this is where you need to understand what gleaning is all about. Now, gleaning is that social net that God has commanded the Israelites to provide for the people. Like, for example, those widowed, those orphaned, and especially those aliens, those foreigners living in that land. Now, to provide for widows and orphans and those who are disadvantaged and disenfranchised is normal. Kakilang, we call it. Your own people. So we, you provide for your own people, it's okay. But to provide for even foreigners in the ancient Near East, this is the only time, the only country, the only place that has laws, the religious laws mandating them to provide. And we read that from verses, uh, from Leviticus verse 19, chapter 19, verse 9 to 10. And of course, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19 to 21. Basically, what it does is you have to leave the ages of your field. If you have a field, you have to leave those ages for those categories of people, the disadvantaged, to come and to harvest during the time of harvest. And this is the time of the Hali and the wheat harvest, sometime in May to October, during this period of time in Israel. And so you have to leave those ages. And whatever you harvest, usually they come in pairs of twos. One will cut and then pass on to the other person who will collect it. Now, if the person who was collecting drops or, did, or the person cutting did not cut properly, there will be stumps left over as well. And whatever you drop on the floor, whatever you leave behind in the field, those gleaners can come and take it. And so, our story returns back to Ruth. Ruth volunteered to glean from the fields around Bethlehem. Now, the modern-day example would be perhaps like um, if you have a cafe and you, you make bread and you donate your bread to those underprivileged people. You have leftovers and you give it to them. Another example would be our mango tree just behind you, right? Outside our church, just here, uh, up the slopes. It's fruitful, it's in abundance. And we give it, not only do we harvest, some of us harvest it almost every week, all right? But some of us um, do not 
eat too much mango. And so there's a lot of rotting mangoes. And so our neighbor down the street um, asked us one day, can my workers from Bangladesh come and pick some? And of course we said, yes, this is part of what we call gleaning. It's a form of generosity, a showing of mercy and God's provision. And of course, our neighbors' workers were very happy. They had, I think, two or three big bags of mangoes, and they didn't even pluck everything from that tree. Now, as we think about gleaning, there are many examples of that, and we'll talk about that later on. But what is interesting as we return back to the story is, Naomi gave permission. And all she said was a simple sentence, very short, three words, go, go, my daughter, in verse 2. And this is what uh, Naomi said to Ruth. But if you are Ruth, what would you be asking? I put myself in the shoes of Ruth. I'll be asking questions like, uh, go where, lay, huh? Right? Go where? And, and whose field should I harvest from? How much can I get? Are there any rules and regulations? Any laws? Is it safe? I'm a foreigner. But all that Naomi said to Ruth was, Go, my daughter. And we realize that Ruth was so obedient. Not a word of protest. Not a word to say that, you know, uh, maybe it's a bit hot, you know, I, I need a break. After all, we travel so far from Moab. No, no complaint. All we hear is so in verse 3. So she set out and went and gleaned in a field. But what is important is in verse 3b. After the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who is or who was from the clan of Elimelech. So happened, so convenient, so coincidental. But is it just by chance? We may be asking. And this is where I want to talk about the hiddenness, the mystery of God. Just so happened. It's as if though it's by chance, right? But do you realize that just so happened it's not so simple because it just so happened that Naomi and Ruth uh, returned to Bethlehem during harvest time. And of all the people that, now, uh, that Ruth could have gleaned from, she just so happened to glean from Boaz's field, who just so happened to come to his field that day at that time when she was gleaning. And just so happened, Boaz was from the clan of Elimelech, one of the people who can redeem both Naomi and Ruth. And it just so happened that he was rich. And it just so happened that in verse 1 it says he is a worthy man, but actually that's translated as very rich. But he was a noble man because he was the one who stood out in the midst of all the corruption. Remember, when was this? This was dated in the time of the judges. They didn't have a king at the time. And we know in the book of Judges, at the end, the very last verse of chapter 21, verse 25, says what? Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It just so happened that Boaz is a nice guy, you know, a, a, a noble guy, a kind guy, a kingly person. And it just so happened, it just so happened that Boaz was able to, and willing to help both Ruth and Naomi. Nothing happens, just so happens. Nothing <laughs> is coincidence. And someone once said, I do not know who said this, but coincidence is a miracle or chance or luck. It's a miracle in which God prefers to be anonymous. I think that is so true. Because nothing, nothing happens by chance in God's agenda. His divine plan 
His plan for you and I will always be fulfilled to the letter. But most of the time, we are oblivious. We are clueless of why, how, and when He does it. And this is God's mystery. The mysterious ways which God provides. His provision is unknown and often unrecognized by us. Isaiah 55 verse 8 encapsulates everything for us when we talk about the, the hiddenness of God, the mystery of God. He says here, For my thoughts, God's thoughts, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. God will always provide, but just looks different from what you and I had in mind. And of course, we don't like uncertainties. I do not know about you. I don't like uncertainties. I want to know what's going to happen. Like after this service, I'm going to have breakfast. All right? So, so that is certainty. I need to know certainty. And we are impatient. We demand, right? We demand. We need to know. And we need to know now. But this is not God's ways. And sometimes the opposite is also true, isn't it? We can park ourselves, hide ourselves with this idea. Oh, so since God is hidden, He's unknown, so therefore He's sovereign, He's in control. So I don't have to do anything. We park or excuse our slothfulness by leeching, depending, leaning on God's sovereignty. But not so for all of us today. Notice what Ruth did. Notice what Ruth did towards the end in verse 7. What did Ruth do? He, she worked hard and she hardly had any rest. She only had a short time of rest. That means she worked quietly and she worked humbly in order for her to glean. She even asked permission first. She has the right to glean, but she even asked the workers' permission first. She did not realize that. That's what the workers said to Boaz. And she worked very, very hard. That is the mystery, the mystery of God's provision. But we must understand, while He provides, we need to trust. We need to trust and do what is right. God provides even when we don't see even when we don't know, and even though when we cannot feel Him. Somehow, some, 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 sometimes we ask, no, I cannot feel God, I cannot understand, I, I don't know. And because of that, we think God is missing in the picture. But God provides mysteriously, and nothing, nothing is by chance. Nothing is coincidental. So we trust and we obey, and there's no other way, all right? even if we do not know why and how He provides. And that's where we lead to our second question. How? How does He really provide? As, as you think about the story, in, in, especially in Ruth chapter 2, how does God provide? Because there are three things that we need to understand in order for us to appreciate and persevere on when life is tough. We need to understand that God's provision is mysterious, but we also need to, secondly, understand the means of God's provision. The means of God's provision. And this is where we turn our attention now to Boaz. Now, Boaz is very interesting. In, in verse 1, we already get a hint of what is said about Boaz. He's a relative of Naomi's husband. And he's a worthy man. The word worthy actually is a, a poor translation in ESV. Uh, the other translation says that he is a very wealthy. The word worthy simply means he's heavy, not in terms of like me, you know, overweight or something like that. It's, it's, he is of substance. In Chinese, we say yo fen liang, wu liao in Hokkien, we call it, right? So, so he's worthy and of the same clan as Elimelech. And in verse 4, we already get a hint a hint of who Boaz is. Notice here in verse 4, it says, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. So he actually traveled there. And he said to his reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. I want us to see 
two things. Number one, already we get a hint of who Boaz is. He is diligent. He's not like those rich, spoiled bread who, who owns a lot of land, a lot of property, and a lot of investment in his bank account. He just kick back, relax, and do nothing. And let all his people work. So he's actually diligent. He is accountable. He goes to his own fields to inspect. And secondly, notice here, he's not only just kind, he's also very humble. Have you ever seen a, a boss coming and say, hey, good morning, everybody, and all those things? Usually it's the employees who say, good morning, sir. You know, whether you're in police or military or where, wherever you are, usually you greet someone first, someone who's elder, someone who is more senior than you. You often greet the person first, right? But not so. Notice that he's the one who initiates. He's the one who starts the conversation. He's both kind and humble, and he greets his people. Do you wish you had a boss like that? <laughs> yeah, how I wish I had bosses like that too, right? He, he even bothers to care for us. And if you are one of the bosses, can you be like Boaz? But then I, I digress. So let's look at what is happening now. And this is where we turn our attention to verses 8 to 16. Now, Boaz showed favor to Ruth, but not just simple, normal favor. His kindness, his favor, his generosity is remarkable. It's overwhelming. But how? How did Boaz show favor? And let's turn our attention now to verses 8 and 9 and dropping a little bit, verses 14 to 16. Let me read for you verses 8 and 9. It says here, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Verse 9, Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young man not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn for you, basically. And verse 14, dropping to verse 14, it says here, And at mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, Come, come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. So she sat beside the reapers. He passed to her roasted Green, wow. And she ate until she was satisfied and she had some left over. Verse 15, when she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young man saying, let her glean even among the sieves and do not reproach her. And also pull out some from the bundles for her and leave it for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Let me break that down for you, all right? You can see very clearly that Ruth had exclusive rights to Boaz's field, and we know he's rich, so she can harvest a lot and probably had multiple fields, so over the next few months, she doesn't need to worry about food. So you get more than enough. And not only just that, you have companion women beside you. You're not alone and, and you will be protected because you're given, the command was given, do not uh, harass or violate this young woman. And obviously, she's a foreigner with no rights in the land. But yet, Boaz assures her, provides for her by providing protection for her. And of course, this is even more remarkable that she will not go thirsty nor hungry, and better yet, she's actually being served. Do you not notice that? She's being served food, and boys personally serve her food. The whole idea of her dipping her bread into wine is the idea of fellowship, that you are kakilang, you are my people. And this is remarkable because why? Why would anyone, why would anyone be so nice to someone, let alone someone at that time, Boaz, 
probably already know that, oh, Naomi, I think this is my, one of my relatives. But she, he probably didn't know what is happening to them. And so therefore, why is he so nice? He went the extra mile. He went beyond. He was overflowing in his provision. And that question, why? Why is he so nice? Was actually asked by Ruth. We read that in verse 10, right? Verse 10 literally tells us that Ruth was flawed by Boaz's generosity. Then she, she, referring to Ruth, fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Boaz, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? You see, Boaz was deeply impressed with Ruth's expression of love for her mother-in-law. Remember last week, we read in chapter 1, verse 16, this is very important for us to understand. Ruth didn't just simply pay lip service. Oh, I will follow you wherever you may go, but in the end, you go ahead and I'll just hang loose. Right? She said in verse 16, she said, For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And this is key. Your God. Your God. My God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. Not a lip service. Not just trying to uncut Paul or make the mother-in-law happy with her. She literally sacrificed her kinsmen, her culture, her comforts, even her own country in order for her to be with Naomi. And Boaz now says, God will not only just repay you for what you have done, which wasn't read for us earlier just now. Verse 12 was was left out. But let me read for you verse 12. This is very key. Verse 12 is the key of chapter 2. All right? Verse 12 says this, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, whose, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. The Lord will reward and repay and rescue Ruth and Naomi. And this reward, this thing is because Ruth came under the wings, the refuge of Boaz, who is now representing the God of Israel in his generosity, in his provision. Notice, this is important, notice that Boaz never, ever once even claimed that he is the one who deserves all the credit. Oh, wow, Boaz, you're so handsome. You're so nice. Oh, look at your bicep. Look at all your wealth. Ruth never had that kind of interaction with Boaz. Boaz simply deferred and deflected all the praise to God. And reminded Ruth that what you said, your God, my God, even though he didn't know that she said that, literally fulfilled that prophecy that she said in chapter 1. Notice here, every single letter of God's promises, his word, will come true. Even if it's spoken by a foreigner. And that begs the question too, right? When we are praised, when things go well, when things are happening, how you respond is very important. Do you absorb all the praise and limelight? You say, yeah, it's me. It's all about me. Or do you deflect it and don't claim the credit but glorify God? Do we get puffed up or do we pass it on to God. And this is important lesson for us. So how does God provide? 
God's provision is always spot on. The means by which He provides is always spot on. He can provide through miraculous ways, but He can also provide through men. And Ruth probably didn't understand this. And in the New Testament, Paul was telling the Ephesians almost the same thing. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think or imagine according to the power at work within us. And of course, he continues on in verse 21, which is very, very important. But let's hold that back and recognize that God's means of provision stretches our imagination far beyond what we could possibly think. And our right response, how we to respond in this kind of provision, is that we should be like roof. We should have an attitude of gratitude. We should have awe, genuine, godly awe and humility of recognizing that God is good all the time. So then, we see that God miraculously and mysteriously provides and His means of provision. We do well to trust Him and we do well to have an attitude of gratitude, right? But now, we want to talk about the messiness of God's provision and this is where we turn our attention to verses 17 to 23. And again, I won't read for you about the messiness of God's provision because it's never about us, it's about God. And the story continues for us. The story continues that Ruth collected a lot, a lot of barley that day. In, in fact, it says it in Ifa of Bali. What is an Ifa of Bali? In, in some of the translation, it literally tells you our modern day equivalent, 22 liters. Now try to carry 22 liters of water. Try, all right? It's about 22 kilograms. 22, one kilogram per liter. Now, compare that to grain, barley some more, which is heavier. You throw barley into water, which floats, which sinks. All right, I hope barley doesn't float up, right? That's the heart of the barley. It's literally heavier, five times heavier. So it's about 100 kilograms of barley here, right? Now, enough for Ruth and Naomi to enjoy um, barley drink for the rest of the year, cook barley soup, barley porridge, whatever, fried barley, whatever cuisine you can think of, and even sell some of that too. And barley keeps very, very well, can keep for years. And so they had more than enough just on one day of gleaning. Notice also that Ruth worked until evening and still had to beat out those things that she had gleaned. And don't even ask me this question. How did she carry back to Bethlehem? Right? I'm pretty sure she couldn't. Maybe she, she, she has biceps bigger than my thighs. I'm not sure. But I'm pretty sure she couldn't. And guess what? It's reading between the lines. It's not part of scripture. But probably Boaz sent his young man to carry it for her. Right? <laughs> probably that. But then that is beyond scripture. We don't want to speculate too much. But notice the conversation now between Naomi and Ruth. And we turn our attention to Naomi's question. Where did you glean today? Earlier, she only said three words. Go, my daughter. No information whatsoever. And yet, now she says, where did you glean today? She didn't ask, how much did you glean today? But she asked, where? Because it's obvious that she gleaned far more than a handful for the day's meal. That's what's happening here. It was so much that Naomi didn't even bother to ask how much it was. And when Ruth said it was Boaz, you can see Naomi's mind working very quickly. And she began to marvel and we read in verse 20, an instant transformation when God provides 
far more than what we could possibly ask for or imagine, guess what? She immediately burst out in the praise and said that, and remember, she's called bitter now, not sweet. She says, may he be blessed by the Lord. He referring to Boaz, who's referring to God, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. She thought she's already dead. Her life is meaningless and her life is worthless. And now she turns from bitterness into praise. See, this is why when we think about God's provision, we, we must realize that God's provision is not linear. It's not the way we think it should be. Step by step, this is how it's going to happen. God's provision is messy. And if you are roof, if, if you are roof, you must be thinking, what is happening here? Because up until now, do you realize that Ruth had never known, never known who Boaz was? She's never been told that it was dangerous to go into the field. It was only later on then Naomi said, uh, so be, stay with the young woman. But before that, never tell her, right? And now suddenly, it was so nice, tell her, you stay with the young girls, yeah? Otherwise, you'll be violated. Never know the danger, never gave her protection, never gave her some insurance or anything like that. And only now, Ruth began to realize, but she probably didn't know anything else about this whole idea of kinsman redemption culture, which we'll talk about a lot next week. Hold your horses. And here, Ruth is still confused, still wondering what in the world is happening. God's provision is not linear. It's not just clean cut. It is messy. And all that Ruth wanted to be was to be faithful and true. And poor Ruth. And here she is, exhausted, tired, and yet at the same time excited by this news. When God provides, it sometimes is messy. It's not cookie cut the way we want it to be to fit into our mold. It is messy. And the, the thing is this, we try and we demand for truths, but God tells us to trust Him. We want it our way, but God tells us to wait. We want control, but God tells us to comply, to trust, and to obey. In happy times, I like this. Uh, I was looking for stencils for our church uh, office to, to beautify Pastor Paul and church office room. And I was looking at, at, at Shopee because there's 99 sale, I think. I regretted looking at it because the, the ads keep coming in. In happy moments, praise God. In difficult moments, seek God. In quiet moments, worship God. In painful moments, trust God. And in every moment, thank God. See, God is in control, but we do not know. And we may never know. But His plans are better than our plans. Many years ago, I watched this movie. I love this movie. It's called Forrest Gump. If you remember that show, it's back in the 1990s. Some of you all are not born even at that time. And there was a phrase that encapsulates the entire movie. It's called, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's what Forrest Gump said. I'm going to watch that movie. I think it's in, in uh, YouTube or whatever. It's free now. But Tom's, Tom Hanks' movie, Forrest Gump, it's really beautiful in the sense that I love this quote because it's so ridiculous and yet it's so really true, right? You know what you're going to get. When you bite into chocolate, you know that you're going to get chocolate. It's just that you may be pleasantly surprised or bitterly shocked by the taste. If you don't like bitter chocolate, I do. But many people may not like it, so you may be surprised by it. And this uncertainty, so-called, even though you know it's chocolate, drives 
people to polar opposites. You can either embrace that with joy and accept that uncertainty, or you can eat your hearts out, fretting over the lack of control and life's apparent constant vacillation changes. Today's passage in Ruth 2 tells us that God provides. How does He provide in times of need? What do we do when we don't understand? What do we do when we cannot see His plan? What do we do when we can't trace His hands? This is the lyrics of a song, Trust His Heart. That's the lyrics of this song. And later on, as a song of response, I know this is perhaps a new song for many of us. It's an old song. I sang this song as a young Christian many years ago. I hope you can meditate on it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 tells us this. The mystery of God, Christ, in whom all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. Christ became flesh to take on all the pains, all the worries, all the sins of this world, of you and I, in order that we may have eternal life when He died on the cross for you and I. That is the mystery of God. And God's means of His provision is through Christ Jesus' death on the cross. And it is messy. The world does not want to accept this truth that a man who is God becoming man can die like Boaz giving unmerited favour to me, a rotten scoundrel. And this, my dear friend, is the beauty of the gospel. And this is the story, the beauty of the book of the scroll of Ruth. And as I invite the worship team to come forward now to listen to this song, Trust His Heart by Baby Mason, may the words of this song encourage you today. Amen. <laughs> 